Order. Um, item 7 on the order paper, the adjournment. The proposer of the topic will have 15 minutes. Uh, as an unprecedented number of uh, members have indicated their desire to speak, I will only be able to allow each member three minutes, with no additional time for interventions unless some names are removed. Uh, I, I call Mr. Ross Hussey. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister in advance for her attendance here this evening. And the fact that so many members are still in the chamber is an indication of how serious the members are taking this particular issue. And I'm going to start by just putting a question in the air. And that question is, when is a parent not a parent? And I'm going to follow that up with, when is a child not a child? And I'm going to leave those questions in the air for a few moments. Any of us from my part of the world and other parts of the world that have attended meetings with the, the parents of uh, children, and I'll refer to them as children, with learning disabilities or intellectual disabilities will understand the frustration and the pain these people have suffered over the past few years. In April of this year, I was contacted by a constituent in relation to the underspend in the Western Health and Social Care Trust on adult learning disability services. As we were in a period of purda, I wrote directly to the Chief Executive of the Western Health and Social Care Trust. And following that, myself and several other MLAs from the West, Western Health and Social Trust area were summoned to a meeting in Londonderry. And some of those members are here in this chamber now. And we were given a presentation. And that presentation really raised more questions than answers. The figure of £8 million was floated, that £8 million may have been underspent in these services. And one of the worst comments, I think, from that particular meeting as we left was, well, we may have to balance the books, but that money may have to come from the services for the elderly. And I see members here nodding. That is exactly what was said to us. But nobody could identify this particular figure or where it comes from. I'm now going to go off script state and I'm going to read a portion of a speech that was given by Gemma Doherty, or Gemma McGarty as she was from Garrison and County Fermanagh. I started work 40 years ago today, Mr Deputy <coughs> Speaker, and I know you're about to say I'm far too young to have been working 40 years, but 40 years ago today I started working and I worked with this lady's father. And the letter she has written concludes the speech she made. My final thought today is this. We, the parents and carers of children and adults with disabilities, are soft targets for all those who are supposed to be providing a just and equitable system for us all. They know that we will make ourselves unwell as we turn ourselves inside out in an attempt to take care of our children. They know that we will never abandon them. They know that in many, many cases, a sibling will take over the role when we are no longer fit. They know we are too exhausted to have enough energy to make phone calls and write letters. And they know that for years and years, we have not told half the story because we don't want to appear to let our children down or make it sound that we don't love them or say that we can't cope and that has suited them. They talk about equal rights for all, yet we all know that even highly intelligent people with physical or mental disabilities find it very difficult to gain employment and face discrimination every day. And as for the children and adults who have the additional complication of a learning disability, well, have a look at Western Trust policy to see what they and their carers' chances are. Most of us know somebody with a learning disability. Most of us know the parent of someone with a learning disability. And how many of us can say that we could do the job they do? My aunt and my uncle had a daughter who had Down syndrome. 
And my cousin was one of the brightest people I have ever met. If she met you once, she would know you again 30 years later. But my aunt and my uncle were well into their 80s when my cousin passed away in her 60s. And they, in their 80s, were acting still as parents to their child. Back to the question, when is a parent a parent? A parent will always be a parent. But when you are dealing with someone with learning difficulties, you are there on your own in many cases. In the public meetings we have attended, we have seen parents in their 80s bringing along their 60-year-old child. That person to them is their child, and that child is fully dependent on their parent. And over the years, the Western Health and Social Care Trust, or the Sparrow and Lakeland Trust, or the Foyle Trust, have taken money away from the services that these people should get. When did this start? Well, we know what started at least in 1994. And in that time, there was an underspend of four million pounds. These are the figures that were uncovered. When we ask the trust for an exact figure, we are not going to be given an exact figure. If if it was four million pounds in 1994, and if it is eight million pounds in 2016, is the figure cumulative? Is it four million over the 20 years? So it's four million, four million. So we end up when we start adding on inflation that we're talking in excess of an underspend of an excess of 100 million pounds. Is that the figure? The people that look after adults with learning disabilities are convinced that is the figure. That over £100 million has not been allocated to the parents or to sufferers with adult learning disabilities. And if that is the case, if that is the case, shame on us. Because for 20 years that was allowed to happen. What have we been doing to help those people? And if I was sitting in this chamber today and I was the parent of a child with learning disabilities, I would think you have done nothing. You have turned your blind eye on these people. We didn't know, and that is quite honest, we didn't know. But shame on us for not knowing. Since I became a member of this House in 2000 and whatever it was, 11, I have often dealt with parents of children with learning disabilities. And I've accepted the story from the Trust, we don't have the money. We do not have sufficient funds. But if they do not have sufficient funds because they siphoned money off that particular area, shame on them. If that was allowed to happen under the management of the Trust, shame on the Trust. If that was allowed to happen under the supervision of a board, I, Shame on them. If that was allowed to happen under the supervision of the department, shame on the department and shame on this House for allowing it to happen. So there are answers that we need to have. But there are also things that we need to know about who was responsible for this. And I know, and we all know in this House, civil servants are never responsible for anything. Civil servants cannot carry the can. Because, oh dear, that person just happened to retire last month, or that person will be retiring next month. This is a 20-year scandal, uncovered by the RQIA, apparently. A 20-year scandal, so now is the time for us to uncover the truth. Every single piece of paper that is available must be made available. Every single pound that was taken from the service must be given back. Whenever parents in their 80s cannot get respite care because we did not give the sufficient money to them, that is wrong. But if this trust did it, and if this trust management board allowed it to happen under the supervision of a health care trust, there's quite a few heads have to be knocked together. And when they all head off to their golden retirement with bucket loads of money, what about those they are leaving behind 
who still have to deal with this. As Gemma's letter says, now Gemma is a lady in her 40s. Gemma has looked after three children with learning disabilities. Two of them have degrees. The third one is at home. During his childhood and adolescence, and now into adulthood, sometimes this person is very difficult to control. Wrecked televisions, wrecked rooms, whatever. And that parent for 20, 25 years is looking after that adult. And then when we look at an adult who is in their late 50s, early 60s, and have a parent in their 80s attempting to look after them. And when they ask for respite, it can't be given. Because we have closed. We have closed many of the houses that we use for those services. Why? Why did we close those services? Because somebody said three people living in one house can't share a bathroom. All the facilities must be en suite, so we'll close it. Or we've withdrawn them at the service because we don't have the money. That's not the case. The money was there, but the money was redirected. Myself and others met with MENCAP on Friday morning. Part of our, our, our new system in West Jerome where we're going to regularly meet with MENCAP. And these are the key issues that they've asked me to raise here today. And I'm going to list them, Mr. Deputy Speaker. As we currently stand, no health and social care trust can identify all those with a learning disability within their trust area. On average, each trust can only identify those with the most severe learning disability. Across all trusts, this is 9,600. And in the Western Health and Social Care Trust it is, we don't know. RQIA identified in 2013 that there was underfunding by 5% per annum in the Western Health and Social Care Trust of Learning Disability Services. We are now in June 2016. Why has it taken so long for this matter to reach the public agenda? Well, it's here today and it's not going away. What action has RQIA taken to hold the Western Health and Social Care Trust and the Health and Social Care Board to account for this? RQIA should, as a matter of public confidence in their role, explain their action and how they try to address this situation. HSCB must, as a matter of urgency, publish the review of expenditure and learning disability services across all trust areas. The review undertaken in 2013 details the level of underfunding and should be made publicly available. The Western Trust must detail for each year from 1996 how much funding they provided to learning disability services and by what percent they were underfunded. It's estimated that the underfunding was approximately 5% per annum, amounting to some £8 million in any given year. Families in the Western Trust have indicated an underfunding situation since 1996, and this amounts to approximately £80 million of services that families and adults with a learning disability have been denied. I personally think that figure is in excess of £100 million. The Western Trust must identify who took the decision to move funding allocated by the SCB for learning disability to a different programme of care. The Trust must identify where this decision originated and who ratified this decision. Did it go to the Trust Board for ratification or was it ratified by senior management? In real terms, this decision is meant families continuing to care while they were at breaking point, putting lives and relationships in danger. Carers to continuing to care during their 70s, 80s and even 90s as they despaired for the services they needed. Adults with a learning disability being denied the services that would have enabled them to have a better quality of life. Failure to provide services that meant adults could be part of their community. And failure to provide housing and support options that would let adults with learning disabilities live independently. It is essential, Minister, that there is now a robust and independent inquiry into how this could and did happen. We need to know how much was underfunded in the Western Trust area. And that doesn't matter if you come from Lisnaski, Londonderry or Limavady. We have four counties, I think, affected here. We have at least four parliamentary constituencies. We have hundreds of families. Why did we let it happen? Back to the question, when is a parent a, a parent? a parent is always a parent. 
My mother died last year and she was 87. She was always my mother, she was always the parent, and she would have remained that for her entire life. Parents here are carrying a burden that we as a state must help support. Mr Speaker, thank you uh, for your time. Minister, I look forward to your answer. Uh, thank you for that. And just before we move to the next speaker, I would advise members that in regard to interventions, there's a large number of members wishing to speak around this issue and to advise members that anybody who does give way can't necessarily expect to be given an extra minute, just uh, if you like, marking people's card on that one. Now, can we move to the next speaker? I call Tom Buchanan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and first of all, can I thank the member for bringing this very important matter to the floor of the House today. <clears throat> this matter lies very close to my own heart. My elderly parents, one in their early 80s and one in their late 70s, are carers for both a brother and an uncle. And I know the care and the devotion that is given day after day with very little respite care that they get. And you know, this is something that reads like a children's mystery book entitled The Western Trust and the Case of the Missing Millions. Yet, unfortunately, this is not a work of fiction. For over 20 years, the Western Trust has been removing millions every year from their budget allocation for adult disability services in the Western area. The Trust uh, thought that adult disability services in the constituency area should not be allocated their funding and removed this money away from the vital services. Was it the case that the Western Trust have got away with this scheme for so long that they thought it would continue to go undetected? It is absolutely appalling that up to £8 million per year for 20 years has been directed away from adult disability services and used in other areas. This fact is so startling that it just adds nothing but questions and there appears to be no one from the Western Trust who is prepared to stand up and to give the answers to the questions that is being asked. Is it any wonder that parents, carers and people who work in special educational needs facilities are angry today? The realisation that these people and the services which they are entitled to have been shunted by the, by the Trust for all these years is an extremely bitter pill to swallow. Let's talk for a moment today and weigh up the mental and the physical cost that this has cost the, the, the very carers and people themselves. Let's add up the cost of these actions by the Trust. Struggling parents have been refused respite care to relieve them from their extremely difficult lives. Day centres have been restricted, have restricted schedules and facilities because of lack of funds, or so-called lack of funds, funds obviously that's directed away somewhere else. Young people have been sidelined and marginalised. Crucial interventions which could make the difference in the quality of life of these people have been deemed unnecessary for funding purposes. The most vulnerable in our society have been discriminated against. Many of these people who will never be able to speak Last for themselves to and stand up for their please. rights have been let down by the Trust. And I think, as the proposer of the adjournment said today, there must be a robust, uh, there must be a robust uh, intervention into Remember this in that the Trust are held to account for what please. has been done. I hear him, Sir Michaela Boyle. Call Michaela Boyle. Thank you, Margaret. Um, firstly, I want to congratulate the member for bringing this adjournment debate to the House and, of course, and congratulate those involved in this campaign, the families and the service users, uh, the Western Learning Disability Action Group, MENCAP and organisations like in my own uh, area, Friends of Glenside and many, many others who are uh, members of that group, for putting the spotlight on this issue and supporting the families and individuals in their quest to get real answers in this debacle since the shock announcement. Answers as to why there has been consistent underfunding for quite a number of years in adult learning disability services, amounting up to £8 million in the Western Trusts. Families uh, of adults with a learning disability have made repeated, repeated representations over many, many years to the former Western Health and Social Care Board and the Health and Social Care Board and indeed the Trust 
about the lack of services for learning disability in the Western Trust compared to other trusts. And on a number of occasions since 2002, carer representations from the Western Adult Learning Disability Group have presented to the former Western Board and the Trust with their analysis of actual expenditure, which pointed to significant levels of underfunding. This, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, fell on deaf ears. Families believe that they have been ignored whenever they presented to the Trust with this information. And I, like others, on the 20th of May, did meet uh, with the Trust officials uh, on a briefing in relation to how this underspend came about. And I suppose to put into context how that, that came about was we were informed it was down to a resettlement programme going back a number of years. A learning disability can affect many people's lives in many ways, as it's been said, causing difficulties in learning, communication and tasks of everyday life. So this is what we're dealing with. Uh, the impact of this deficit on adult learning disability services across the Trust will now need to be fully documented. Families have continued to cope with the caring role with limited assistance and at great cost to family life, health and income. It has impacted on the ability of the Trust to recruit appropriate numbers of social workers, community workers, community nurses, daycare staff and other professionals who could identify and deliver on the needs of these families. The pressure on the frontline staff in trying to cope with unrealistic caseloads and maintain some services have an impact on delivery. This needs to be addressed, and as a member said, there are key issues that need to be explored in this. Gormayla Mayoga. Uh, Iram Sir Mark Durkin. Call Mark Durkin. I would agree with everything that everyone has said uh, th thus far, but from one point uh, from the proposer, uh, Ross Hussey, and he says, we didn't know, and the shock expressed by other speakers. This issue didn't just drop out of the sky. The issue of the deficit for learning or spending and learning disability in the Western Trust had taken on almost mythical proportions over uh, a number of years where people would have heard about it. It might have reared its, or raised its ogly head uh, during the annual furore over uh, places in, in, in daycare provision, for example, for young adults with their disability, but it was never confirmed. And I won't be the only person here who will have raised questions about it, only to be bamboozled, in effect, by obfuscation and denial. Now, finally, it has been confirmed by the Trust uh, that there ha has been a huge and historic underspend in this area. Now, the feeling on the ground of the families that I have spoken to is in the indicator, and, and I think members from elsewhere across the Trust area have confirmed it today, is that had it not been for the RQIA report and its imminent publication, that the Trust would not have, uh, ha have come public about this underspend. That, in fairness to the Trust, they have facilitated meetings with us as MLAs and elected representatives. We have asked a lot of questions. We have, as Mr Hussey said, probably come away with more questions. There are layers and layers. I said layers. Uh, the, de the deficit, it seems, can be traced back as far as 1994 through legacy trusts and a myriad of bureaucracy. And a failure to address it means it snowballs from £4 million, we think, in 1994, to what Mr Hussey assumes in the wording of this motion and the figure we are all using today is probably in the region of £8 million. And for those of the, uh, who are listening or, or reading in this that might not be aware, that is per year for over 20 years. Millions and millions, tens of millions of pounds, possibly over £100 million that has not been spent on services for some of our most vulnerable members of society, and that is just shocking to say the, the least. It is my understanding that RQA are currently completing a further uh, study that should establish the full extent of the underspend, but how could anyone calculate the full cost of that underspend, the physical, emotional and mental cost uh, to service users or people? Who wanted to use a service were, were being denied, the member to draw his remarks uh, to a close. and their families, as they fought for services for their loved ones and for support for themselves, 
The cost of that is immeasurable. I call Gary Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the member for bringing this uh, very important topic to the floor uh, today. Uh, several weeks ago, I went along to a public meeting in the City Hotel, my own constituency, uh, where family members and uh, carers and uh, fellow elected members were gathered uh, to discuss this very uh, serious issue. And it was understandable at that time that there was a high level of emotion, um, hurt, there were tears, there was anger. And of course, uh, we as elected members uh, shared in that and voiced our own concerns um, and our own uh, anger at it as well. And of course, we did meet with the Trust um, on the 20th of May, as was mentioned. And it was a useful meeting, albeit we did leave with more uh, questions than answers. Uh, it was made clear to ourselves that it was first identified in 1996 that there was a £4.4 .4 million deficit uh, going into adult learning disability and it is staggering to think that that was over 20 years ago and still to this day uh, very little has been done about it. And in 2015 um, the, the previous minister did allocate an additional uh, uh, £350,000 uh, towards learning disability. Unfortunately that was um, helpful but it was a drop in the ocean in regards to the overall uh, scale of the problem. Uh, I know uh, the previous members did touch on the fact that at this stage we still do not know the extent of the deficit. £8 million has been mentioned. Of course, uh, the fact that we don't know in itself is worrying because it could be uh, and it will be more, uh, but it's how much more. And I think we need to see the, the report uh, from, from the Health and Social Care Board, which is due out uh, hopefully in the next couple of months. And we look forward to seeing that uh, and seeing how we tackle and how the Minister is going to tackle uh, the serious underspend. Uh, last week I did uh, mention to the Minister at our Health Committee uh, that there needs to be a thorough investigation into why this happened and how it happened because there is a clear uncertainty as to how this went under the radar for so long. Uh, it's clear that family members uh, had, sus had suspicions and concerns about uh, services. But again, this is, this is not all about finance. This is the fact that these uh, family members will not get back uh, the time that they've um, lost with their, their family members and the, the support that they had lost out on. So I, I would just finish by calling on the Minister to provide reassurances to the families and I know that she, she has listened to the committee last week and provide that reassurance but also uh, to ensure that this situation cannot be allowed to happen again. Thank you. Aaron, sir, Michelle Gildenew. Call Michelle Gildenew. Um, like others, um, I welcome the opportunity to discuss this and thank the member for bringing it to the House. Um, I don't disagree with anything that has been said either. But these families are genuinely bereft at all that they've gone through, the experiences that they've had, um, the care that they needed and the support that they needed that wasn't forthcoming. And um, at the meeting on the 28th, um, I think that it was made very clear to us from the Trust that they wouldn't be seeking additional resources, Minister, from you, that this would have to be managed within their budget allocation. But there are families out there who, who genuinely, who, for who, this has nearly been treated as a bereavement, because all of the things that they've been looking for and asking for for years that haven't been forthcoming because of budgetary issues, they find out that that money was available and was spent on other things. And it's a massive blow to families Families who are, as we've heard here today, supporting adults, and thankfully, um, adults who are living much longer. Um, you know, I can remember probably a generation ago when adults with conditions like Down syndrome, their life expectancy was very poor. Thankfully, it is much better now. But as a result, if we have adults who are living into their 40s and 50s, and even in, in some cases their 60s, obviously their parents are getting older and older and much less capable of providing that care. And also dealing with their own health issues, their own mental health, their, um, their ability to, to care for a child, and the uncertainty in knowing who is going to pick up when they are no longer able to do it or no longer here. And the fear and the worry amongst um, parents of children with learned disabilities who don't know what kind of care their child is going to get after they pass away. Um, that fear and uncertainty is something that eats them up. 
So I would ask the minister, like others, to, to do a very thorough investigation into how this happened and to see what can be done to support those families, bring in some creative or innovative ideas to help them to cope with this news and to give them some succour for the future, that their needs will be met in a more timely fashion. And if that means extra respite beds been um, procured in some way to give people a break, to enable them to, to continue on the fight and to ensure that they're given their child the best support that they can now, but that their child then also has the best and most dignified um, care that they need when, that, when their parent Barton is no Barton longer Barton able to provide it. Gurmila Malgov. I call Rosemary Barton. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I have listened intently to what each speaker in turn has had to say this afternoon. And I want to refer to a lady I sat beside at one of the Western Learning Disability Action Group's meetings. At this meeting, she spent most of it wiping tears from her eyes and becoming more and more emotional frustrated and angry as the appalling extent of the underspend became apparent. She explained how it was a continuous battle over the years to have her family member assessed, then a fight to find an acceptable school, and during that time, and how as her child reached adult, she had to move house from the country to the town so that she could avail of some of the provision provided. As a carer, she felt totally isolated, with no one to turn to. This is only one example. Generations of adults with learning disabilities, I believe, have been deprived of the opportunity of a better life. Many families have had, have had detrimental effects on their personal life and family life, with financial, which financially no compensation will ever redress. However, I do urge the Minister, through the Western Health and Social Services, to start working immediately with all the families of the adults with learning disabilities and cut through the red tape in relation to immediate support on respite services, daycare, social work support. The Western Health and Social Services Board must come clean and explain fully how this gross underspend happened and be transparent and open in their explanation, including the number of years that this deficit has existed. Many of the carers I have spoken to have for years lived on a knife edge financially. Many homes have had to be adopted and renovated to accommodate loved ones, sometimes at the expense of family holidays. Caring is a 24-7, 52 week per year, with extremely limited opportunities for respite and indeed very limited family time. The impact that money could have had on their families will never now be able to be measured. What makes this deficit more difficult is that it is the most vulnerable in our society that has suffered. Mr Speaker, can I ask that immediately the Minister put in place a programme of support for both the carers and the various adult learning disabilities there are, ask the to draw remarks so to that the high please. cost financially, socially and to health is lessened forthwith. Thank you. Iram Sir Barry McElduff. I call Barry McElduff. Again, uh, Deputy Speaker, can I say that uh, the Western Learning Disability Action Group, the parents who are associated with that group, uh, many of them based in the Oma area, are very familiar to me. And I found the engagement with MENCAP in the course of the recent election to be a very compelling engagement, where, as Ross has indicated, subsequently, as a group of MLAs in West Tyrone, we have agreed to meet in a regular format with MENCAP to discuss uh, issues pertaining to the learning disability debate, to be properly informed, to support people. And, uh, I just want to note that Requia identified in 2013 that there was underfunding by 5% per annum in the Western Health Trust area of adult learning disability services. I think that's the key point. And I suppose it would be good to know what has Requia done to hold the Western Health and Social Care Trust and the Health and Social Care Board to account for this. And I suppose if the minister can throw any light on responsibility 
is it was it the trust was it the board that will be useful you know I think that the health and social care board uh, should publish the review of expenditure on learning disability services across all trust areas but not least the Western Health Trust area I want to commend families parents carers who care for adults with their learning disabilities and indeed children with learning disabilities and proper funding would enable them to have a better quality of life. I do identify with what Michelle Gildernew has said, describing the experience for many of the families of learning about this underfunding over a lengthy period of time, describing it in terms of a bereavement. It did appear to me to be like that, and uh, I just want to support Michelle Gildernew in the point that she made. But in relation to the future, you know, I am supporting the call for much improved respite services for aging carers, for adults uh, who care for other adults, for families. And uh, where should the money be taken from? Well, it definitely should not be taken from domiciliary care, as was hinted at in one meeting that I attended. Um, I think the, the key point is that there is a major disparity of support services across trust areas. And I think that parents, for example, in the Oma area and the Straban area, other parts of the Western Trust area, they look enviously across at services enjoyed by families, ask the member to draw his remarks to by close, families in other uh, health trust areas. So I just want to add my voice to the consensus that is here today, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Aram, sir, Daniel McCrossan. Call Daniel McCrossan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank you to uh, my constituency colleague Ross Hussey for bringing uh, this debate to this House. Given that we have a limited time frame uh, in, in terms of the amount of people looking to speak in this, I'm going to get straight to the point. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, Minister, this was an unprecedented scandal. We are not getting answers. Is it the Health Trust? Is it the Health and Social Care Trust? Who is responsible? We can't even get those answers in relation to this um, unbelievable failure in relation to the most vulnerable people in our society. How on earth is people supposed to have trust in this House if we still haven't got those answers? We still don't know if it's £8 million a year or less. We still don't know that. How are we supposed to get the answers for the people out there that are suffering day and daily until we can answer the most simplest of those? People are suffering. And you're right. Michelle Gildernew is absolutely right. It was like a death. We stood in those public meetings and we watched tears. We watched people cry. We watched people's lives ripped apart before them. And even yet, even yet, Minister, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we cannot get the answers to the questions that we have. This is the most important debate, in my view, that has come to the floor of this House at this juncture. And I would sincerely hope that beyond this point, that we can get the answers that are necessary. I would like to commend the people that have brought this to the public domain, the families that have been saying for years, for over 20 years, that something is wrong. They knew people in other trust areas that knew they were getting better services than we were. And the most disappointing thing about this, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is that when we asked who is responsible, Dan, this isn't a game of pointing fingers. Well, I'm sorry. But someone needs to be held to account for a lost life, because that's what that is to the many people and many families out there, a lost life. Mothers, fathers giving up jobs to look after their loved ones, to look after the most vulnerable in our society and ensure they had that, the, the most important, fundamental, necessary care that should have been a protection from the trust. It should have been. And they're in the gallery, some of them. Frances McHugh is listening intentively. And I want to commend her because she is one of those people that have suffered unnecessarily. We can go into the ins and outs. We have three minutes, but my point is simple. Minister, Mr. Deputy Speaker, this House, those families, our communities, the Western Trust area, wants answers, deserves those answers, and must have them. No more of the dog, the tail wagging the dog. This Please remember to, to draw his remarks to a close, time. please. Uh, Aram, Sir Raymond McCartney. Well, good. Uh, I'll ask Conclure. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Speaker. And again, can I commend Ross Hussey for bringing this important issue to uh, the Assembly today? 
I think you know, all the issues have been fairly well and truly articulated. There's just a, a number of points which uh, I would like to make. That, uh, I met with the families in Derry in, on uh, May the 18th, and one of, one of the things that actually struck me about the meeting, and there had been a public meeting in the City Hotel previous to that, was that the families had, had known for a long number of years uh, about this, and, and despite their best efforts, they, if you like, they break through. Uh, the barriers that were surrounding it, they always knew that there was a, a sense of underfunding, uh, that our services were being provided. And the other thing that struck me, despite the, the obvious emotion, and people here ha have spoken about the emotion uh, surrounding this issue, was their, their positivity and their determination that for them, and the way forward in this was to right the wrong that had been uh, brought upon them and their families and the people whom they care for. It. And I think that's important that, that we lend our wit to that positivity to ensure that we get resolution for the problems which are, are undoubtedly have been there. Uh, all our members have alluded to uh, the meeting that the, the Trust uh, briefed us on the 20th of, of May in relation to this. And I think uh, the Trust accepted that there was underfunding. They accepted that the funding had been provided and given to, to all our services, and I think that in itself is, is where the focus should be, how, how that was allowed to happen, and I think that was the, the main thrust of the conversation from my recollection that particular morning. But we also welcomed, and in, in speaking to individual members of the action group and families, they welcomed the pledge by the trust that they wanted to resolve this in a spirit of partnership, and I think the families and the action group in particular have welcomed that, but I think there, there is some concerns, and I think there are genuine concerns that the definition of partnership may be different for the trust than it is for the families. And I think we have to create the climate uh, where that sense of partnership is true, because they're, they're already saying that uh, because of the, the the way the trust is approaching this, the families don't want to be put in a position that it looks as if there is money going to be taken from our services to provide the, the, the gap in, in, in their funding, because they don't want to be seen to be responsible as raising their voices to get what is their entitlement, and then it looks as if it's been taken from someone else. So I think that's a, a genuine uh, request by the families and by the action group that the partnership, how these decisions are being made, and how the trust is resolving them is done in, in true partnership. Iram, sir, Sean Lynch. I call Sean Lynch. The last can call you, and most has been said uh, to date, and I agree with all the speakers, and they have ventilated everything very well. But how can we go forward and, and give hope to these families? Because we have all listened to them, we have been at the meetings, and uh, I would say uh, to the Minister, the Trust needs to work with uh, those, these families and the Department and put in plan a, uh, to rectify this gap in funding, because that's what families need. The issue has been very badly handled by the Western Trust, there's no doubt about that, and fa families were rightly angry when this underspend became uh, apparent. Families need clarity, they shouldn't have to fight tooth and nail. I know a woman, she's been looking after her 18-year-old uh, daughter, it didn't come as a shock, she's been fighting for years. Um, these families uh, ne all need our support going forward, Minister, so Sinead, Carmela Mayogut. Aram Sir Richie McPhillips. Call Richie McPhillips. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and it's great to be able to get the opportunity to contribute to today's debate. And I thank Mr. Ross Hussey for tabling the debate. Uh, as, as most members have already covered a lot of lot of the ground, uh, and I just want to make a few points. Uh, just back in May, I had one of the first opportunities to meet with families. A meeting in a skill and heard first hand of the great difficulties that they are all facing. These families are really struggling through no fault of their own. The chronic underspend has been left, left, left many of them trying to cope in a caring role with no hope of assistance, and that comes with great financial cost and great cost to family life, health, and well being. I reiterate my full support to these families, with many of them from across my constituency, and I fully support them in their campaign for a proper service to be put back in place immediately and to have this historical underspend dealt with. And I, like many other members here today, fully support their calls for a proper independent inquiry. 
It's become clear that many of these families affected have struggled and fought for years for proper funding, only to be told by the Trust, the Department and the Health and Social Care Board that there's nothing irregular on how resources are being allocated to learning disability services. It's a sort of a buck passing exercise and blaming someone rather than taking the responsibility and, and, and being held to account for their actions. If this funding shortfall is, has existed for some 20 years, it's nothing short of a travesty. And the question has to be asked, how is this and how has that impacted on other services? Mr Speaker, patients and families want answers and they deserve answers. They deserve them now. The Trust has also stated that they will work with families implica um, implicated and that they will bring them on board. But I have to report that I had a visit to my office in Lissenskee by one of the parents and she advised me last week that no contact has been made to date to take them on board. Is this yet another empty promise? Mr Speaker, the SDLP is a party. We also met with Trevor Miller recently, and we, who assured us that plans will be put in place to address all the very serious concerns. We have written to Mr Miller, and on that day we marked his card, and we have written to him in the last few days looking for an update on what progress has been made. So, in conclusion, I give the commitment to these families that we will continue to seek monthly updates as to what is happening. And to conclude, also, Speaker, I'm glad that the Minister is here today and I look forward to her response to these very important issues. These families need answers, and she is in the position to provide them. Thank you. Iram Sir, Kiva Archibald. Um, I'd like to also commend Mr Hussey for bringing this debate and I know I'll be repeating some of what's already been said but I feel it's important to put on record the concerns of my constituents in East Derry as well. Um, like others here, I've attended a public meeting organised by the Western Learning Disability Action Group in Brimbada Resource Centre in Limavady and I also attended the Western Trust um, briefing for, regarding the underspend. The sentiments being expressed by families have already been articulated very well. Um, they have been let down over many years. It is difficult to quantify, and when I say quantify in, in this instance, I do not mean numerically or financially. I mean in terms of the services or support that could have been provided if the appropriate level of funding was available, and what difference that may have made to the lives of those living with learning disabilities and their families. At that meeting, we heard from families who have supported loved ones over many years. We heard of lack of respite care and limited day centre services. We heard how much a difference these services can make to a family and how many f parents feel abandoned as they get older and are struggling to cope with adult dependence with very little support and of their very real worries as to what will happen to their loved one if they are unable to care for them. We also heard about the massive difference that real effective support from organisations like Destined can have in the lives of those living with learning disabilities and allowing them to reach their full potential. Our citizens deserve nothing less than to have those opportunities, and it's a travesty that more of those types of support services are not in place. It's important now that we learn from this. Families have called for an independent inquiry, and we support that call. We need to get a full understanding of the level of underspend of how this was allowed to continue over the considerable period of time that it occurred, and we need to address that underspend with a similar level of investment. We need to listen to what the advocacy groups and support groups are, and also individuals are telling us about the type of care and support services that are needed and we need to work to deliver on those. We need to have different models of support, trust delivered, direct payments, whatever it is available for different individuals to access depending on their circumstances. Family need, families need to know support is there for them and their loved ones as they get older and young people who are currently struggling to cope with learning disabilities need to have hope that they will have support into the future. I know we have a receptive Minister for Health who is open to listen to all these suggestions and I am confident she will ensure this issue is fully addressed in a way that is acceptable to those most affected. Call the Minister for Health, Michelle O'Neill, to answer. Can I, um, like other members, I mean, from the start I want to recognise that I do also believe the issue has been badly handled. I think that the families and carers do deserve answers, and that's certainly going to be my job of work um, as I look at, at the information that's in front of me. I think that most members have all spoken, all members have spoken very passionately and spoke about the real face of this issue, the real um, challenges for those people who care for their loved one who has a learning disability. So I think it's important 
that we're discussing it today, and I think that it's right and proper that um, the issue has given rise to a great deal of concern right across all of the political parties and the, um, among families, obviously, and communities in the Western Trust area. Before I address the points that have been made during the debate, I want to assure all those families that I do share their concern and that my, my priority is to ensure that their voices continue to be heard and listened to as the Trust seeks to resolve this issue. As I said in the Chamber last week, I think in response to, um, to Ross Hussey in terms of question time, it was the level of concern that was expressed by family members when I first came into office in my first um, week in office. I sought an urgent briefing with officials which confirmed that the nature of the problem concerning the funding of adult learning disability services in the Western Trust is an historic one, which other members have um, referred to today. I'm aware um, that the figure of eight million is a figure that's been discussed and quoted widely in recent weeks, and the amount of underspend the trust needs to address. And I think it's important that we don't, I think because other members have even referred to other figures here today, we don't have the quantity of the figure in terms of um, the information. Some have even referred I've listened to some people saying that this is going back um, over 20 years, so we could be looking at an even larger figure. So just to be very, very clear to the families that are listening to this debate today, because I don't want to cause any more angst to people who are already um, extremely concerned and angered by what they have seen to, um, unfold over the number of years. So I absolutely understand why families are anxious to know the actual figures involved. So my um, focus at this point is on ensuring that they are fully engaged in the development of the plan going forward. The Western Trust is now urgently working on, um, with the support of the HSE Board to robustly and accurately quantify the spent and gap that has occurred. And I think that's really, really important in terms of providing that information and that clarity so we know the scale of the problem which we're dealing with. I've also listened to members refer to the, the need for real engagement with families and carers, and I'm disappointed to say that, or to listen to, to um, some of the evidence that suggests that the trust still hasn't learned its lesson and is actually still not engaging properly with families. So I'll make sure that I take that on board and relay that to the trust to make sure that there is proper and real engagement. Um, I think that the plan in terms of going forward will set out how the trust intends to address the gap, which is obviously something that families want to know about and be involved with. But again, this aspect of the plan must be, as I said, fully communicated to families who I'm aware have raised concerns about the implications of redressing any imbalance on other programmes of care. So these are a group of people who feel that they have been wronged by the trust, but they're concerned about the implications for other people who may need health and social care services. So I think it shows it's a testimony to the people that they are. So a lot of questions have been asked today around responsibilities and who does what. And I think that um, whilst ultimately spent decisions at a uh, local level are for trust to make, I will be closely monitoring the trust progress to ensure that it is focused on delivering solutions that take account of what families and carers are saying. It will come as no surprise to this Assembly whenever I say that there are obvious um, and real budgetary constraints facing health and social care system, and they are such that it is incumbent on all parts of the system to ensure that the resources we do have are prioritised to meet the needs of our communities. And This, no doubt, will be a key factor in the work the trust is doing now, together with the board, to resolve this issue. But I certainly, in terms of my position and going forward, I've been in post now for four weeks, and I do want to transform the health and social care system, and I do want to get to a point where we're adequately addressing the needs of people with learning disabilities and those who are more vulnerable in society. So I want to see a change in picture where we actually have real investment to provide real opportunities for those people who have learning disabilities, that we provide real support for those people who have care and responsibilities. And I think that is when we can truly be judged by in terms of delivery. So certainly that's where I want to get us to that point and I look forward to engaging with all members in terms of how we actually get there. I just back to the, to the issue which we are dealing with today, I think that um, I hope that it is clear from my remarks that I do take the issue very seriously. I think that um, it is the people obviously behind the headlines, the people with learned disabilities and their families that we need to reassure and support going forward. That is why, as I said last week in this chamber, I have sought an explanation from the Trust of their handling of this issue to date. I am currently considering the Trust's response. It is also why I will be meeting some of the families later this week. and I look forward to that meeting to hear at first hand their views and their concerns, which will obviously help to inform any future action which I may take in relation to this issue. In conclusion, I think that many would agree, whilst it is absolutely right that this Chamber gives a voice to people with real issues and that, that needs things that need to be addressed, like the Western Trust issue, which we have just debated. But I also want to put on record 
and we don't forget and recognise the good work that's going on within the health and social care system and those staff that work tirelessly to make sure there's proper opportunities and proper supports for those people who are more vulnerable, in particular those people with learning disabilities. So I want to take the opportunity for thank, to take this opportunity to thank. I've got a very short period of time, but I want to take this opportunity to thank those working across the five trusts for the high quality of care that they do provide, because I think it's important whilst we've identified a problem and something that seriously needs to be addressed, and I recognise that. There are excellent healthcare staff that are actually day and daily working really, really hard to support um, people out there who need services and need support. So just to put that on record, but I think that the, my clear message that I want to send to the families and to the carers today is very clearly that I take this issue seriously, that I am listening to your concerns, that I will be engaging with you in person, and that I seriously will give um, due consideration to the report back from the Trust, because I think that if we, and I'm listening to all the comments around the, the Chamber today, people still don't understand the problem, people still don't seem to be getting the answers that they need, so obviously the Trust isn't communicating it properly with um, people. So I look forward to, to taking that forward and I want to assure the House and those people that are impacted that I will certainly not be found wanting in terms of my support for those people with a learning disability. Carmichael. Okay. Before we turn to adjournment, I realise this is the last um, formal session of the Assembly um, in this term. So I would like to wish all, all members a somewhat restful uh, maybe recess period, given that we've just come out of an election followed by a referendum. I'm sure people are a wee bit drawn with that. So wish everybody all the, the best and I look forward to uh, seeing everyone back again in September. So the next item on the agenda is that the question is that the Assembly do now adjourn. The Assembly is adjourned. <laughs>